Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya, and I'm a second year student in the full time MBA program, also Vice President of Industry Relations for the Rotman Healthcare Management Association. So, welcome to tonight's keynote presentation with Will Falk, our executive in residence, virtual care in Canada, and looking at finding the right balance. Although this event is taking place virtually, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional lead of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, while we are meeting virtually, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we were grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So I have the pleasure of introducing to you tonight's speaker, Will Falk. Will splits his time uh, since retiring from PwC among several organizations that are trying to improve health care through policy and digital innovation. He is a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute and has an appointment with us here at Rotman as executive in residence. He currently serves as a board of director at Virto Health and First History. He has sat on several other successful digital health company boards during his career. He's an innovation fellow at Women's College Hospital and a senior advisor with Satoy Consultants. Before I hand it over to Will, a quick note about the Sandra Rotman Center for Health Sector Strategy, the sponsor for tonight's presentation. The center is supported by the school and the Rotman family and focuses on three main areas. First, research and thought leadership focused on health sector challenges. Second, outreach events like this one to encourage dialogue and learning on topics related to management in the healthcare sector. And third, educational programming for emerging and senior leaders in healthcare management. One of the school's newest programs is the Global Executive MBA for Healthcare and the Life Sciences, designed for working professionals in mid to senior positions in organizations and businesses across the sector. Our fourth cohort started last week and we are now recruiting for the fall of 2020. So now I'm going to hand it over to Will to lead us with our talk. Thanks, Maya. And uh, thank you uh, to the Sandra Rotman Center and the Rotman School for uh, giving me the chance to talk about this. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to briefly um, talk a little bit about where we are in virtual care at this point in the fourth wave. Uh, and then Maya and I are going to have a bit of uh, a discussion about some of it. And hopefully um, a number of you, I, I see some familiar faces in the audience, as it were. A number of you will throw stuff into the chat as we go. And Maya and I will try to um, uh, do that. Um, the QR code in the upper right corner there links to the Wave 3 report. Um, this was originally intended as a, um, a Rotman presentation with students uh, as the focus, um, uh, but it's uh, we opened it up and it's got quite a uh, broad group. Um, so I just want to say a few thank yous to uh, some folks. Um, Actually, first off, I'm just going to acknowledge that um, I'm up north on the Joseph Brandt land grants in the Grand River, uh, and that has um, uh, the implication that sometimes my internet doesn't always work as well. So um, today's talk, it's the first time I presented this talk. It comes together with the help of many friends and colleagues. Uh, it's based um, in part on material from a report that uh, I prepared for uh, the federal provincial table on virtual care. That report was finalized in late May, early June, and then translated and eventually published in August. Um, uh, and uh, the QR code on the first page allowed those of you who wanted to to go to that or you can, um, uh, you can find it. Uh, I've got great colleagues here at Rotman and a whole bunch of uh, uh, former students, as well as at Women's College and the Center for Digital Health uh, Evaluation. Um, of note, um, I'm going to call out Michael Chung, who's a second year Rotman student who was uh, instrumental in uh, some of the work here. Um, the rest of this is uh, thank you, but also a bit of a declaration on conflicts. Uh, there's a formal declaration on the file at Rotman. In um, 
2020, in a period of about two weeks, uh, Canada opened up virtual care codes and virtual care uh, overnight went from being a relatively marginal activity in most of our health system to, I think at the peak in Ontario, we were at 77%. Uh, Dr. Bacha and colleagues um, have done some uh, study on this data. And there are a few things that you can see out of that. Uh, first off, we went way up. Um, total volumes were down a little bit early, but, uh, but tracked with prior year volumes. Um, and uh, the telephone predominated. Uh, telephone still predominates today, um, depending on the province, between five or 10 to one over uh, video. That's not something that many of us forecast, uh, but has been the case. Um, what happens happened during the pandemic with the use of virtual care tends to depend on your perspective. Uh, during the uh, Health Canada study that I referenced, we had the chance to interview over 100 uh, clinicians, system leaders, entrepreneurs, and government officials, uh, some of whom I'm delighted to see are on this call, uh, checking that we in fact reported what they said accurately. Um, I would say that there were four main streams of how people viewed virtual care. Now, now remember, this is at wave three. I'm, I'm gonna say that wave four beat the light ra life raft view out of most people. Um, there were still at the start of wave three, there were still people who thought that this was entirely a temporary expedient and that we would return to quote normal. Um, the second view, um, was uh, the view that um, uh, this is a low rules environment or a low rules experiment. Uh, those of you who've tracked Ontario politics will, will recognize the, um, the reference to health links around low rules. Uh, some of you may react uh, negatively to that. Some of you may react positively. Uh, that was a joke. Maybe it wasn't funny, but um, anyway, um, there were a lot of people who viewed it as an experiment and uh, viewed it as a chance to, to uh, think about how we do things. Um, there were a lot of reactions to the rules, ranging from completely unnecessary to penny wise, um, uh, the use of, uh, uh, of rules by software vendors to protect market positions and lock in client bases. Uh, the use of uh, by service providers to protect um, uh, outdated production models, um, and the, the, the in a low rules environment, we tried new stuff. The third way that a lot of people, and I'm going to say this, tended to be more the technology people viewed things was as a stress test. Um, we had been building systems in this country in digital health for, you know, around about 20 years. Um, some of those systems just fell over, like they, they, they didn't work uh, when we tried to scale them. Um, some of those systems were kind of perversely located inside of hospitals that we couldn't get to. Uh, so that didn't work all that well. Um, some of them were pilots that no one had ever put money into scaling, so it actually wasn't that surprising that they fell over. Um, but then there were some, some real successes. Uh, I think uh, Prescribe It um, had a kind of a, uh, an immediate five-fold volume increase, and that's uh, gone up. Um, mental health had a, a flourish, e-consult, e-referral services, and a whole bunch of specialty care, and I'll come back to that. And then, of course, the humble telephone, um, which had a renaissance because of uh, its um, reverse compatibility, because of its widespread understanding as a technology, um, had some huge implications for access. The final perspective was the perspective of a kind of a shift towards consumer oriented healthcare in its most extreme version. Uh, this was people saying, oh, finally we get to do uh, consumer health. Um, you know, that's 
been interesting to watch. Uh, one thing's for sure, uh, we've seen a flowering of uh, consumer-oriented apps. Um, I was surprised when we, when the team, when we, when Michael ran the numbers, that uh, we in fact had a twenty billion dollar industry uh, in digital health in Canada. We'll come back to that, uh, but um, just, just uh, that sense now. What I hope I did there was to mix the four perspectives up, but to make the point that different people came at what happened with different perspectives and many of their conclusions were dominated by the perspective that they took as they, as they went into it. After we did the interviews, after a lot of data analysis, we came back in wave three. Uh, that QR code, by the way, takes you to the report. If you haven't read it, um, you can go ahead and grab a copy again now. And there were eight major uh, su uh, summary recommendations. I am not going to unpack the eight major summary recommendations. They're all there and you can go and you can read what I believed six months ago, what we believed six months ago. Most of which I think was pretty good, um, but because it was a live report and because things are changing, I wanna double down on five areas today. Uh, many of them are rela um, related to the stuff we covered in the report, but I wanna go beyond it and unpack and explain things. In at least one case, I wanna apologize for an oversimplification and go into a few other things. But this is my one page summary of the report that I've been using with, with short talks, et cetera. And it gives you an idea of kind of where we ended up uh, burning down, you know, 40,000 words into one slide. The five things that I wanna talk about today are money, the double baseline, mandating digital information by 2023, market structure in digital health and how we enforce standards, and then primary care. I start with money because it's a good place to start. Um, it's really important. Uh, money drives a lot of behaviors in the system. Uh, even when people don't want their behaviors driven by money, they, they still are. In the report, we recommended the creation as uh, as, as much as possible of modality neutral remuneration systems. Now, modality neutral is very hard to achieve. Every fee system has a uh, bias um, and I'm gonna unpack some of those biases in, in, the, in the next slide. Some of the things we emphasized were one, that you want to move away from fee-for-service where possible. Two, that you want to pay for asynchronous care. Asynchronous care, meaning messaging of different types, is very important. Three, that you want to actively incorporate accessible virtual front door services. Four, that you want to pay for some basic provider-to-provider -provider communications. That's e-referral, that's e-consult, but it may be other things as well. The non-micromanagement point is really important. We're in a place where we're evolving. You can't set this stuff, you can't lock this stuff yet. You probably won't be able to lock it for four or five more years. And then finally, very Ontario, important in Ontario is the use of bundled funding. I'll come back to it. Um, actually, let me just hop, hop forward here to this. Um, as I said, I haven't presented this deck before, so forgive me for choppiness. Um, the health system funding journal uh, is a journey. It's, it's not a destination. One, one of the things people miss about funding reform is that there isn't really a best practice in health system funding, in that any system you put in place will inevitably have games that can be played with it over time. And so health, systems, health system funding systems become stale over time as participants find games and they need to be constantly adjusted and they need to be actively managed by health system managers. 
I give an example of this. Um, uh, the excellent capitation systems at the large clinics in the US, Mayo Clinic, Emory, Cleveland Clinic, um, that, that are salaried systems, all have very active clinical management. And so active clinical management in a capitated environment is necessary. If you just put capitation in place and don't do it, you end up with Sweden circa 1975, which is not a place you wanna be, let me assure you. Um, I've listed six different places here. Uh, okay, I'm gonna illustrate this with uh, four um, stories and a QR code. Uh, the first story is length of stay based payments. In the 80s and 90s, we paid hospitals on length of stay based payments. Um, people around the world did that. It was the norm in hospitals back to WW2. And we did that either implicitly or ex explicitly by not having case-based payments. When we moved to more case-based payments, we saw our concomitant, concomitant with the move, we saw average daily census per capita crash as we saw in other countries. When I say crash, I'm talking about 50% reduction in the number of people in hospital beds per capita in a period of 10 years. That's how big a difference payment can make. Oh, here's my apology. Um, in the report, we put 1355 as the um, recommendation, and that's for one is messaging, three is phone, five is virtual, and uh, sorry, five is video, and, five, and the second five is physical. And the reason we did that was to give some guidance as to relative pay scales. Um, I got a phone call, I guess, three months ago from a medical association um, uh, talking about um, the negotiations and how someone was quoting 1355 um, uh, in the negotiations. And they were making the point, not unreasonable point, that in their province, they have very long phone calls with people who don't have access to good internet who can't do a video. And that therefore phone calls should be paid higher than video or at the same level as video because they were the same thing. What am I trying to illustrate here? Look, when, I, when one says that on average men are taller than women, that doesn't mean that all men are taller than all women. These are population-based numbers. The reason we put 1355 in the report was to give broad general generalities. It may have been too broad, I apologize. You cannot replace common sense with a fee schedule. Third, bundling of hips and knees. A lot of virtual care can be buried in bundles. Uh, John Semple started doing this uh, for surgery uh, back at Women's College for breast reconstruction surgery, I'm going to say 15 years ago, had a really, really interesting thing happen on this in Ontario over the last few years that I'm sure some of the people on the call have been involved in. When you have a hip or a knee with a length of stay of one or more, it's coded under the old Ontario system under QBP, quality based payments. When you go to zero, it's no longer QBP eligible for reasons that only the ministry would ever understand. And so if you drop the length of stay to zero by virtually supporting the patient pre and post op um, uh, uh, so that they have a five or a six hour length of stay and they go home, which is perfectly possible, you lose your QBP payment. Well, okay, so no one's gonna do that, right? So the point being, uh, I mean, Melissa Farrell was still in the ministry at the time. She was, you know, a sensible ADM. So she rewrote the rule and we did that. Um, finally, yes, you do have to do phone messaging and web. No, you can't just do video care and say you're doing virtual care. Most virtual care is not video care. Why is that? That is, for a bunch of reasons, but mainly um, you, you 
well, I'll leave it because we're going to pick up the pace or we're not going to make it to the timing. Uh, no, I'll finish it. The standard for politeness on video is much higher than phone and physical. The patient who's happy sitting waiting for 45 minutes in the primary care doctor's office with a three-year-old magazine expects them to be on time for a virtual care appointment on video, but they don't necessarily expect that for phone calls. And that societal level understanding of what a video call is means that video calls will have a very limited role in and will need to be viewed in a similar way to, to physical visits. That's my opinion. You can disagree with it. There are some great disagreements. One of them is, is that you can use WhatsApp um, and similar devices to switch back and forth between phone and video. And when you do that, I'm not sure whether that's a phone call or a video call, but I think it makes my point just in the opposite way. Okay, all payment systems need clinical oversight. All payment systems need clinical oversight. This is not some deist clockwork system where you know God shows up and sets up a fee schedule and then lets it run forever. The world doesn't work that way and fee negotiations are a terrible way to organize things. Um, I'm curious, I wonder how many people click through to Paul Martin's urology website. Okay, let's talk about provider change management. Uh, the Rogers uh, is a business school, so people know the Rogers uh, paradigm for change management. It is literally as old as I am. Uh, it was published the year I was born, and you guys all know it. You've got the 2% innovators. You've got the 13.5% early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, the laggards, right? And we manage that way, except no, we don't. We go to 77% in two weeks. So the management problem in virtual care has been different because we jumped all the way over to the late majority in two weeks. What we thought we would be doing was climbing through a generation of modernization. Instead, we jumped, we dropped back down between wave one and two, and we dropped, went way back up. We're coming down again, but the Ontario number was 422 today on a Monday. So dot, dot, dot. Um, where do I think it'll stabilize? I think it'll stabilize somewhere around 30, 35%. And then I think over time, as Slack-like and WhatsApp-like systems come in and better communications come in, it'll grow to two thirds of total visits. I know that there are at least three people on this call working on those kinds of systems right now. Um, I saw Duncan Rosario, I think Bright Squid is on. All kinds of really interesting innovation going on. Duncan, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of your company or I would have shouted out the name. Um, okay, how do we manage this? We manage this as a double baseline, in my opinion. So going forward, when you wanna do your research study or your management study, you've got your 19 baseline and you got your 21 baseline. You were forced to do a migration, but as my friend Sasha is fond of saying, there wasn't anything all that magic about the 2019 baseline either, right? We did things because we did them. We didn't know why we did them. We just had always done them. They were usual and customary. So we had six month follow ups. Were six month follow ups better than five months? Better than four months? Better than eight months? Well, no, but we did six months follow ups, right? So now you get two baselines that you get to manage from and that you get to innovate from. So the double baseline clinical trial and the double baseline innovation ba basis moves us forward. We talked about this in the report. I'll give you a few examples of why I think you can't go back to 19. I think that there are things that have flipped and they flipped and can't unflip because they're so commonsensically obvious. Uh, IBD, I'm sorry, inflam inflammatory bowel disease, particularly pediatrics. Uh, so used to be um, a lot of the visits, family visits would be physical. 
uh, used to be down at Sick Kids. Um, you do some used to do some of the delivery remotely. Now we we've moved to uh, much more remote delivery, monitoring, text and phone and video when needed, and quarterly calls with an advanced practice nurse uh, managing the day to day. Uh, mental health. I don't think I have to belabor this. We've had a huge switch on mental health. Uh, over to virtual, a lot of people very comfortable with it. Um, some evidence that maybe they're more comfortable than they were with physical president presence, but certainly lots of benefits in terms of reduction of no-show rates, in terms of uh, 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 visits. So I think that even when the cost of physical contact drop, they'll, we'll still see that. Pre and post-surgical bundles, I've already spoken about it. Uh, with hips and knees example, with the um, uh, breast reconstruction examples, I think those are those are going to continue and should be expanded as 21 baselines. Uh, CHF and endo meds titration coaching management often on the phone. Um, uh, you know, med lead uh, down. This, there's an interesting thing going on, and this is an active area of research for me, so I'm just going to take a moment to go into it. I have noticed increasingly, as I look at these apps, that there's almost always a paramedical player somewhere in the mix in these digital chronic care apps. So CHF, endo, mental health, IBD, um, physio physiotherapist for the orthos. You've almost always got this mid-level provider. And what's really interesting is that often because of successive fee negotiations, we've delisted the ambulatory provision of the mid-level provider's scope of practice. And so what is effectively going on here is the digital is allowing the relisting of the mid-level provider into the care pathway. And I think that's what's happened with ICBT. And I think that's what, you know, if you look at Isaac or Medley down at the UHN, I think that's what's happening. So there, there are some interesting common lessons here, some great work going on down at Unity and elsewhere uh, where people will look at specialty care. I think it's very clear that specialty care is embedding virtual one piece at a time. Let me turn to the digital side of the house. Um, I, we said in our report that results should only be produced digitally by 2023, April 1st. Now, in truth, we actually recommended six things, including e-referrals and a few other things. I am backing off a little bit um, but I am saying, and I want to say very clearly, that, that it is my opinion that we have reached the point where we can now make the public policy decision to tip labs and prescriptions, and that governments should make policy decisions to only allow the digital creation of labs and pharmacy um, requisitions and results as of April 1st, 2023 with remediation. At the same time, all primary care EMRs and all hospital EMRs should be required to provide upon request a usable, machine-readable, and searchable digital uh, uh, replica of the record. Many of these systems can already. A number of them could with a little bit of a push. Why am I recommending this? Why, are we rec why did we recommend this? This has become a quality of care and access issue. We are putting lives at risk. I don't want to point fingers, but the, the system failure was over 10% in some core systems, and that is not acceptable anytime except in the middle of a pandemic, and we need to fix it. 
We've reached, as I said, in labs and prescriptions, a level where I believe we can tip it. And I believe that with every hospital having a QR code reader, that we can remediate using QR codes. What do I mean by that? For those who are not ready, with QR code readers now ubiquitous, I believe that a QR replica could be printed of every single lab rec and every single pharmacy prescription so that an EDI system could then pick it up. It's not perfect, but I believe it's a workable way for, for um, uh, governors of the system to be able to tip the system. And I believe that it is time to tip the system. Okay, I'm gonna keep pushing. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about digital integration. Um, there was a plan, um, it's right up here. This QR code here is in fact the plan. Uh, it's actually, it's the 2004 or five uh, info annual report because I couldn't find the plan, but it has a lot of the plan in it. There was a plan for systems of record and there was a plan for interoperability. This is the EHR blueprint version two down here, this little QR code that Jose and Dennis wrote. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can, look, there was a plan. I promise it was a plan and we executed on it and we didn't do badly relative to other countries. But a funny thing happened on the way to the plan being implemented. And that's that this crazy industry grew up and Omers and George Weston and TELUS and Sun Life and oh my God, Power Corp, uh, you know, all came into healthcare. And you know, what's a poor planning bureaucrat to do when all of these people come into our nice little healthcare system and disrupt our plan? And that's what happened. And part of the problem is, is that we thought a record looked like this. We thought a record was a filing cabinet. We thought a record was a filing cabinet that produced a bill and a bunch of EDI. We learned through the companies here, but, but also through Input Health, which you know, TELUS just bought, uh, that in fact, we need systems of innovation that do these things. And they need to do these things. And in fact, maybe the filing cabinet is actually not the most important thing, right? Like maybe the communications is the more important thing and the filing cabinet and the bill are just back office administrators. So if you accept that, and you understand, because many of you understand that 80% of our hospitals are on US standards. And they're not bad US standards. It's taken the US 15 years to get to this point where they now have APIs that are enforceable, maybe. So how are we going to enforce APIs in Canada, guys? What are we going to do to make sure that we have liquid data? So I said that we got to tip it. We've got to put the labs, labs, pharmacy, and the patient record request into the public domain. But once we do that, how are we going to move data amongst the systems? And how are we going to manage and police our APIs so that that works and so that we don't put undue burden? on the underlying EMRs. Now, I did a longer presentation on this. I think it was the red QR code three or four slides um, ago. And uh, I talked in that presentation about why APIs are so hard. And I don't wanna burden the non-API people on this, but the API people will, and have told me that they love this slide because it's like, it's like the elephant in the room, right? Like you can make APIs unusable. Saying that there's an API isn't enough. You have to actually have a way of enforcing the APIs. The US has it in hospitals. How are we going to enforce APIs in Canada? My suggestion, we use the US standards for hospital systems, it's a safe harbor. Adopt them and adapt them 
this is a federal role. As far as EMRs go, and I talk about this more in that other presentation, there are three big EMR companies in Canada now, physician EMRs. If you, okay, there are three, just like there are three telcos and five banks. They need to be regulated for competition and in the public interest. As public, I don't want to say utilities. I want to say, I want to say they need to be managed and regulated in the public interest. We need a theory of how we are going to manage competition in this space. I've discussed labs and pharmacies. I've discussed remediation strategies. I want to take a poke at the people who say data is the new oil. Because I read a history of John Rockefeller recently. And folks, we do not want oil barons in this space, okay? We do not want it to take 40 years before a progressive government steps in and regulates people who are treating our data as the new oil. If someone says data is the new oil, tell them that they are a robber baron and uh, then go back and read the Titan, the great Rockefeller biography. Okay, primary care, last topic. And then Maya and I are gonna do some questions. Um, okay, I've been really aggressive on some other stuff. I've been doing a lot of thinking about it. Maybe too aggressive if I have, I apologize. I'm really humbled by the primary care modernization that's happened. And, and I just quite simply don't have a, an easy answer, but I have some ideas. I wanna share the ideas and see if we can, we can get, a, get it going, uh, get some more discussion going. I think that this is gonna be a long and iterative process. Um, there've been marked differences between capitation and fee-for-service during the pandemic. We need to understand those. There are these big emerging integrated groups, you know, we, Apple Tree, Elna, Meta Centers, they're, they're really interesting. I'm not clear whether they're going to end up being competitors or collaborators with the three big system vendors. But what's interesting is that they're big enough that they could actually manage some of those guys. So that's interesting from a competitive point of view. Patients voted with their feet. There were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of unsatisfied patients to turn to other options. Um, that's a real problem. Uh, nurse call lines, like in some provinces were up five to seven fold during the pandemic. And nurse call lines are not cheap. They're, they're about the same cost as primary care visit. Why we can't set a primary care system up where primary care doctors and their office staff are the first place that people turn to for information about our system, I am unclear, but that's the challenge. We need to manage both ease of access and continuity of care. In our report, we introduced the technique of a Pareto efficient frontier. Yes, I am allowed to talk about Pareto efficient frontiers because this is a school of management. And Pareto efficient frontiers are the line that show the trade off between two variables. In this case, continuity of care and ease of access. What we tried to do in a preliminary way in the report was to show how different types of primary care trade off access in hours, days, and weeks versus continuity of care. And we included some things that people don't usually think of as, um, as, uh, as primary care. So we did include 811 telehealth uh, and the nurse call lines in there. We did include employer provided services. We included physical walk-ins and virtual walk-ins. The point is, is from a consumer facing point of view, a consumer has a set of needs that involve both continuity of care and ease of access. And they are judging the different types of primary care that we are offering 
And we need to think about the judgments that different types of consumers are making. And, I, and I'm sorry, I know a number of you do think about this all the time, but that's, but that's the point here. A lot of experimentation is going on. Um, provinces need to focus on connecting their nurse call lines and walk-in services first. Excellent work is being done in at least three provinces, attaching orphaned patients using virtual front doors. We need way better management systems. I mean, due respect to the people who have been writing letters recently, um, writing a letter to every primary care doctor in your province is maybe not how we wanna be managing uh, the clinical interface of our system. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna um, stop there. And uh, Maya, I'm gonna turn over to you. I see that I haven't had a chance to look at the chat even once. So if you can help me sort this out and maybe we can have a bit of a conversation, that would be great. No, that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Will. That was a wonderful presentation. There's lots of information there. We'll start with some of the comments and questions from the chat. So one of them, uh, Zaina from Teladoc had mentioned is visits really the right unit of analysis. So we can see with some companies like Dialog, we have a 20 second text as a visit. Um, and should this be something that we uh, change the the title for and some examples that in, came up in the chat were care exchanges, care check ins, problem resolutions. And how do you think this impacts, you know, how people uh, look at virtual and in person when taking a look at that visits unit of analysis? Yeah, it's a great question. And and like the point, of course, right, is like many small uh, interactions may well be better than um, than uh, than one or two big interactions. You know, the guy who first made this point to me was uh, uh, John Semple, who I've referenced a couple of times during this conversation. And um, what John did was to replace the seven day visit and the 28 day visit post-operative with a picture of the, um, he was a breast surgeon. So the women's, the woman's bre breasts every four hours. And, you know, if you think about that from a fee for service point of view, like what's the right payment? Like, clearly it's not like he's doing a visit every four hours. Um, and yet he's replaced the seven and the 28 probably a higher standard of care, maybe. Maybe he hasn't replaced the 28, I don't know, actually. Um, so, so this question, I, I mean, Zaina puts her finger on it as she usually does. I, I, I mean, let's start by saying fee-for-service is a great way to pay people who pick fruit, but for your highest paid knowledge workers in a society, Really, you're going to pay them like, I, I, anyway, so, so we need a different way of paying it. The problem I have saying that is that, you know, it's not like our capitated systems did really well during the pandemic either. And so, you know, when I, when I, when I, so Zaina, when I speak out against fee for service, I worry that people then hear capitation and then I, I know that the policymakers are all sitting there thinking, yeah, but I'm like not getting value for money at all on my capitation systems right now. To which my response is, well, if you manage the capitation systems and actually got anywhere close to what you contracted for, maybe you would be. I see stuff in the chat. So someone's probably saying. Yes. Uh, that, that actually one of the questions that comes up that I think is relative to this is Duncan asks, how do you propose moving providers and government to a funding model which stratifies types of visits? So you've mentioned a little bit about the uh, financial aspect of it. So what, what would you propose based on, based on that? Oh, okay. Um, so Duncan, I think that there's a, a set of bundles um, that allow us to get a long way down here. So. Uh, I'll be Ontario specific if I if I can be allowed to be. Um, I would uh, probably uh, use the existing QBP based payments and expand the QB based P based payments to consciously include virtual care for the surgeries and other things that they cover. 
I, I think before the pandemic, we had CHF stroke and a few other things worked up. So, you know, I think we could very quickly declare that virtual care is in those bundles. I've talked about IBD. I think mental health is doable, that you could have a, um, uh, a follow-up um, ability that, that, that was messaging based. So all of those things are, are good ways to do it. On primary care, I'm much less certain about how we do it in Ontario, in part because we've so clearly locked ourselves into a, um, if I use the phrase, um, uh, locked cage match, does that resonate from, from Thunderdome? You know, two men enter, one man leaves. Um, we've got the we've gotten into this thing with uh, with, with with capitation where one side feels they've overpaid and the other side. Anyway, I, you know what? The fee negotiators can take care of that. I don't claim to know how to solve the primary care thing, but as I as I said, it does need to be solved. That was way too long an answer. No. I'm that, that was great. And we also have a question from Michael. So virtual care technology is improving health in many ways, yet many individuals and subpopulations remain digitally excluded, affecting their access to care and health information. So I assume digital access and the quality of that access should be more seriously recognized as a key determinant of health in Ontario and Canada. And do you have any comments to that? Yeah, um, I just, you know, I don't think I said it enough. Um, so I want to say it again. Um, the phone saved us in the wave one and wave two parts of the pandemic. Um, our video systems, I mean, people bought, you know, Zoom licenses and team licenses as fast as they could to try to make up for the fact that everything collapsed. But um, the phone really saved us. Um, so I think that phone, phone messaging, I want to go back to Zaina's point, and maybe I'll, I'll show the cut slide. Um, I, I'll make a couple of nuanced points here. The, the, so Zaina's right that these are touch points, not visits. Um, the, the, uh, from Kaiser 2019. The, 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 the way to think about this, I think, is um, uh, like Slack or WhatsApp, uh, or someone today was telling me they're using Telegraph because it's HIPAA compliant. I was on with a clinician who was telling me that. Um, what you want is a recorded stream that allows you to know when you did contacts with colleagues or even with patients, um, what your message was, what your phone call was, and to be able to switch from phone and video. So I think that we will instantiate calls much more often using phone and then flip to video where it's clinically needed. And I don't think that phone and video are two different things in five years. The way that, you know, when I'm talking with my kid and I've got low bandwidth and he's in the US, I'm on FaceTime and then we switch to video if we've got higher bandwidth, right? Like, I just think that's the way the world works. And, and you know, my kid explained to me how I can switch between the two. And I use Facebook messaging with one of my sons and I can see my, you know, no, I guess we can't use Facebook messaging. Although I got to tell you, a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors, confessed to me that they were using WhatsApp during the um, uh, during the uh, pandemic because it was just so much better than any other technology they had and because it hid their identity. Some of them went on to say, I would have used I would have used FaceTime, but but it doesn't hide my identity. Um, I want to show another thing here and I, I brought this up. I didn't put it in because I couldn't figure out where to put it. But but um, this is the this is the, the scary thing for people on messaging. This is um, Bob Wachter is the head of chief of medicine at University of California, San Francisco. And um, they use Epic. 
and they use Epic as a messaging system. So like using Epic as a messaging system is like using um, uh, Microsoft Project as a messaging system, right? Like it's like, oh my God, my head's gonna explode. This is so clunky. Um, and, but look at look at the volume growth they've got. They've gone up five fold and they're now doing 2 million messages a year projected for this year. So the comment up on top is from uh, Jay Parkinson who founded Sherpa. Um, and, uh, and it's a really interesting interplay on the messaging piece. I don't know that I answered the question, Maya, but maybe I did. No, I think you got to a good point, especially bringing this up um, on Epic. I also had a question regarding um, how do you anticipate the future of virtual health providers? So there's so many innovators today and you pointed out the four major US standards. Do you see that happening with uh, virtual health as well? And what does it, what do they need to kind of get there to those standards? Yeah, my current thinking and um, I'd be interested to get reactions from the EMR folks. I think we need to set up a commentary panel that comments on the usability of the three major players APIs. And then we have to have an open discussion about whether they're giving us usable a APIs. On the flip side, we can't, we have to be reasonable about what we're asking the vendors to give us um, in terms of APIs and uh, usable APIs. So there's a balance that has to be done there. Um, I was thinking that what we should probably do is as an interim step is, is have a fair play panel that actually actively comments on whether vendors are playing fair or whether they're doing the data is the new oil thing. Because one of the things that's really distressing, sorry, let, let me go right to your question and, and throw a slide back up. Um, so Cerner is the only one of these four that publicly reports results. And uh, Cerner has an excellent product um, and along with Epic is winning most of the Canadian uh, deployments these days. Um, but, and Epic doesn't publicly report, so I'm, I'm gonna pick on Cerner in the following comments. If you look at Cerner's income statement, such a huge portion of their revenues comes from integrations and services work and Cerner consulting and maintenance. Like I'm gonna say in the most recent reported year that more than half, you know what, I shouldn't say that. A very large percentage of their revenues are related to that whole integration piece. And I'm just not so sure that that, that should be um, a profit center. For these companies, like I, I, you know, I, I, I forgive me, but we wrote ten thousand dollar checks to, for every physician in the province. Didn't we buy access to this data once? Like, like, didn't we get that? And if we didn't get that, then who's answering for that one? So I think I answered your question. Now let me be clear. Tell us well, and. Um, uh, Tell us well and Weston haven't played those games to that extent yet. And I'm hoping that none of them will, that in fact, that they will create open ecosystems that work in a fair and even handed way for the benefit of everyone. And I don't want to presume that they won't um, or, 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 or say that they won't, but that's kind of how I'm hoping. And I, you know, I, I got a couple of retired friends who I think should be doing that. Um, yeah, okay. And, and the, another question we have from the, the group is, um, how do we find the right balance of virtual care delivery for chronic diseases such as diabetes? Yeah, um, so I, I said the mid-level provider point already, right? Um, um, so, so I actually I was having a fascinating conversation with a senior primary care doc about this today for about a half hour. Uh, it's such a tough issue because you've got primary care and then you've got continuing chronic care, which sometimes happens in a primary care practice, but sometimes gets moved to a specialist 
to supervise some of. But putting that complexity aside, a well-organized digital system almost always in chronic care appears to have the characteristics of having a supervising physician, a mid-level provider who's paid between a third and a fifth of what the supervisor is, and then the patient plus minus their family caregiver. And those four people in a circle of care, um, so, and, and that family caregiver is obviously can be their parent or the child, depending on whether we're, what, what age group we're talking about. But those four people need a communication system and a payment system that suits their needs. The problem is that we delisted all of those mid-level people if they're not in a hospital over the last 25 years. I mean, when I was a kid, you could get a physiotherapy appointment under OHIP and get it paid for. And now physiotherapy is not part of my health system? Like, really? Like, my shoulder hurts, okay? Physiotherapy is a part of my health system, okay? Mental health delivered in ambulatory center is part of my health system. Dietitians for my uh, relative who has diabetes is part of my health system. They should be paid for or included in some way. I don't know how that works um, and it's complex, but the 1960s system where we only pay for stuff in hospitals and then physicians, like that isn't working for me in a digital world anymore. Actually, you know, who, you know who's got this great, who really explained this well is the pharma care people because they've got this problem where employer coverage is now by pharma care people, I mean people who want public pharma care. When we set the system up, most drugs were given in or near hospitals. And so hospital-based, I mean, like hospital-based delivery of very expensive drugs was the norm. These days we give out drugs that cost, you know, thousands of dollars a month and they're in your home. And so, well, of course we couldn't cover that because it's, it's in your home. It's in your home, so that's not like part of our health system. So this question of how, if you can imagine like different levels of cares and different sites of service, including virtual, how do we manage that matrix so that we're fairly covering all of them and not like falling off a cliff when we leave the hospital? I mean, on the flip side, you know, you got people like Dialog who've stepped in and they've managed all of those mid-level providers with a very little doctor level on top. And they're, you know, they turned it into an employer-based plan that people love. So I, you know, but I think that's the challenge. One more question and then we're done? No, we're done, I think. Yeah, no, I think we're out of time, but I wanted to say that was an incredible, informative, insightful presentation. Well, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, just the to say the Sandra Rotman Center has two upcoming events, both posted on Rotman events um, website. So we have the session two of our seminar series, Learning from COVID, Driving Innovation at the Creative Destruction Lab. That one is on November 18th at 9 a.m., as well as Citizen Innovators, Digital Health Volunteers During the Pandemic. This will be a panel discussion hosted by Will with four volunteers who provide daily data to the public on the pandemic. And so that is on December 1st at 5 p.m. So join Will again for that. Um, and we just want to thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.